let that start. All right, looks like it has started. Perfect. OK, so welcome everyone. Thank you, Raquel and Doug, for uh, the introduction and um, kicking us off. Um, so Raquel gave a, a great overview of what we can expect today. Um, so I won't belabor that. What I am going to do is I'm going to share my screen. We've got a brief PowerPoint presentation um, queued up for you all. So um, as, as was alluded to, we are kicking off our conversations on 2025 budget and legislative development. Um, Raquel gave us a nice overview of what we're going to be touching on today. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, so while we're not going to be focusing heavily on budget topics today, I did just want to make sure that we had a brief overview for those of you who may be new or may need a reminder um, of kind of how the budget development process occurs over time and what the key points are. So budget essentially takes three different iterations, agency request budget, governor's recommended budget, and the legislatively adopted budget. So um, the ARB or the agency request budget, we're going to be using a lot of acronyms today, um, is typically developed in early 2024 and then is submitted and published of August of the same year. Um, so we're currently working with the governor's office um, and awaiting some guidance on what pop, the pop situation is going to be for the agency request budget. And um, again, with another acronym, pop is a policy option package, which is essentially a proposal for a new investment in the budget. Um, so. Once we have our agency request budget, that essentially serves as the option list or the menu for the governor to consider as she builds her governor's recommended budget. So the governor's recommended budget um, is typically published in December. So December of 2024 is roughly when we can all expect to see that. Um, and what that does is it often pulls from a suite of items to ultimately be created. Um, one of those items will be our agency ARB. There will be portions um, of our ARB. Um, the GRB also pulls from governor's priorities, both for our agency and within other agencies. And then the last key piece for folks to be aware of, um, which is a key difference between the GRB and the ARB, is the governor's recommended budget actually has to be balanced. So there is a, a, a certain level of math and accounting that goes into ensuring that all the pieces that the governor wants to be in actually fit within a certain um, uh, cap in terms of money that can be spent. So once we have the governor's recommended budget, that essentially serves as the agency's starting point for negotiations during the long legislative session, which is uh, slated to kick off in January of 2025. Um, so what essentially happens from there is the legislative committees within the legislature during session review the GRB, they hold public meetings, and then the legislature determines and votes on what's in the budget. So there will be portions of the governor's recommended budget. There's often other pieces of legislation that have fiscal impacts that may get pulled in to the budget, um, which will ultimately uh, culminate in the legislatively adopted budget. Um, the other thing to note is that in addition to what happens during the long session, there are also emergency boards and potential special sessions that can also impact the department's budget. So the, the legislatively adopted budget, depending on what's going on in the legislature, both during session and in the interim, um, can all have a variety of impacts on what our budget actually <clears throat> looks like. Legislative concept timeline. A little more straightforward. Uh, so here is the general overview of the timeline that you all can expect um, as we know it right now. So April 30th is the day that we need to submit our legislative concept topics to the Department of Administrative Services. Um, so when you see LCs, that's legislative concepts and legislative concepts are proposals to amend statute. Um, that's when we say LCs, that's what we're referring to. And um, so the April 30th date, I want to flag, this is language or any language or topics, including placeholders. So April 30th is not the day by which we need to have everything fully baked, but this is when we need to submit topics to the Department of Administrative Services. June 28th is the day that we need to have placeholder language or all of our legislative language submitted to DAS. Um, and from that point, Legislative Council will then begin to be drafting language for our bills and everybody else's bills that have been submitted. Um, and so what that then leads us to is a, some point in roughly mid-September where we typically receive our bills back. And there's about a 14-day period that we have to submit any requests for changes. Um, 
to the bills that we receive. And so the important thing to note about this timeline that's not really noted um, is the time period between June and September. And while it's not noted on the timeline, what we often see happening is uh, bills that maybe need more policy work um, or further discussion, conversations between um, stakeholders in the agency and that policy work is occurring between that June and September deadline or that, that those two deadlines. And so um, it's not noted on the timeline, but we do plan to continue conversations as they are necessary on certain policy topics that may need more work. So um, that allows us to, when we get our bills back in September, to actually have, um, if it's needed, some ability to submit language that we've already vetted with stakeholders. So that's just kind of a note to be aware of. And then the next date that is important is December 13th, which is the pre-session filing deadline, which is essentially the time by which bills need to be filed if they are going to be introduced for the January, um, the January start date of the 2025 legislative session. So those are those are the primary dates to be aware of. So before we jump into our legislative concepts, the, the actual meat of our discussion, I want to do some high level um, briefing on more or less the development considerations that we made <coughs> when we were crafting our legislative concept list. So um, in recognition of a need to be strategic and efficient with our resources, we engaged in this work to kind of help narrow our focus and um, make sure that we were uh, as an agency kind of being strategic in, in how we wanted to approach legislative session. So when we were developing these topics, our first consideration was um, whether or not they implemented IWRS recommended actions as well as strategic plan priorities. So we really wanted to make sure that we were being aligned with the integrated water resources strategy as well as our strategic plan. We also wanted to be realistic with staff capacity and timelines, given all the new work that we have on our plates from both the 2021 legislative session as well as the 2023 legislative session. So um, we really wanted to be, uh, we wanted to balance what those realistic timelines actually could look like given all of the stuff that we have on our plate. Next, we wanted to be considerate of potential impacts to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, as well as services for underserved communities. Um, and then lastly, we really wanted to focus on improving core agency functions and deliverables to enhance overall customer service and outcomes. Um, and so what that means from the legislative concept perspective is we really wanted to focus on urgent issues that needed addressing by the end of 2025. So um, think program sunset dates that we want to keep around. Think revenue shortfalls that need to be addressed to keep programs functioning. Um, so that's that's pretty much what we had at the forefront of our mind. Um, I want to pause and see before we jump into the, the meat of our discussion, if there are any questions about process at this point. Go ahead and raise your hand, um, or we can also use the chat. I will do my best to kind of monitor both. Not seeing any questions at this point. So I will go ahead and move on. Great, okay. So in terms of legislative concepts, we are currently considering five different pieces of legislation um, uh, as something that we may be attempting to address for the 2025 session. And we typically don't run any more than that due to just the staff capacity it takes to actually move something through the legislature. Um, so we are gonna run through these at a pretty high level. Um, and I'm also going to highlight where there are opportunities to further engage on some of these topics. Um, there is a handout that is included in your meeting materials. It's both in the meeting invite. I sent it out yesterday morning, and it's also posted on our website that has a table that lists out the legislative concept, um, kind of the problem statements and the proposed solution. And then we actually have some draft language for two of these. Um, so we're going to work through these at a high at a high level. Um, and then we are also going to actually take a look at two of the pieces of legislation that we have some draft language for, um, for your consideration today. And, and we'll be focusing the meat of our conversation really around those. Great. So um, we're going to start off by talking about the bills that are going to be either placeholders or that we are planning to discuss in other venues. So. As it sits right now, we are projecting revenue shortfalls in several of our programs that rely on fees. 
Um, this includes the well construction program, the dam safety program, as well as the water rights services division. And so I'll kind of highlight what each of those items, uh, kind of the, the, the situation as it sits for each of those items. Um, so for well construction, uh, the well construction program is almost entirely funded by fees. There's a really large fee component in terms of how the, the overall operating budget of that program um, and really the ability for our agency to inspect wells um, and protect public health and safety and prevent groundwater contamination relies on resources for really three key things. The first is to actually inspect wells. The second is to conduct technical well log reviews. And the third is to be active in the processes of licensing well drillers. And so we are facing shortfalls to support staff that are funded by both the start card fund and the driller licensing and permit um, fees. So those are the two kind of primary areas that we are seeing shortfalls um, for the well construction program. Water right transactions and dam safety fees are in a very similar position. So staff in both uh, the dam safety and the water right services division are partially supported by fees as well. Um, and these programs are really core to the department's mission of responsibly managing the resource as well as maintaining public safety. And so similarly, we are facing shortfalls to support staff funded by dam safety annual fees as well as water right transaction fees. Um, so with all of that said, we are pairing those conversations with some additional policy work with both externally with stakeholders and internally with staff to streamline processes and policies um, around the water right transaction process, which kind of leads us into our next item, which right as it sits right now is a placeholder item on the water right transaction processing efficiencies. And um, so as those of you who have been around the department know that we are experiencing backlogs and increased processing times in several of our water right programs, including water rights, transfers, and protests. And while you can um, trace some of these backlogs back to inconsistent funding, we are also exploring as a department opportunities to streamline processes and policies related to the water right transaction process, including and considering um, potential changes to statutory language to kind of help reduce, reduce transaction processing timelines and make the process a little more streamlined. Um, so that said, what we are hoping to do is take each of those three topics and have conversations about them and with stakeholder groups in a separate venue, essentially all at once and kind of um, marry all of those discussions together at once. So have a conversation about fee shortfalls and also have a conversation about how we can make the process more efficient. Um, and we're kind of hoping to do those at the same time. And so that said, we have a series of meetings on these topics scheduled between March and June um, to really dig into these items and, and dig in and discuss more in depth. And so we have sent out a meeting, uh, or excuse me, a participation request. Uh, we sent that out in late 2023. And so those of you who were interested in participating, thank you for responding. Um, our first meeting is actually going to be this afternoon um, after lunch at one o'clock today. So those of you who may have missed that message or those of you who maybe have since decided that you would like to participate um, and do not have meeting information, please, please, please reach out to me as soon as possible um, so we can get you added uh, and you can either email me or shoot me a text message. Um, either of those things work, um, but we want to be sure that if folks want to be included, um, we get you included as early as possible. So. That's where we're at on those three items. Again, we have separate venues to really dig into those topics. Um, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about these items today. But before we jump on to the other two legislative concepts that we actually have some language to discuss with the group, um, I wanna pause and see if there are any questions um, before moving on. Uh, good morning. I'm a little bandwidth limited, but um, was curious in terms of the placeholder for water right efficiency improvements. I may have missed it. Um, were you looking to release draft language at a certain point or um, going to 
maybe if you can run through what that process is, um, that'd be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, Kaylin, thanks. That's a great question. So we have been doing some internal work to work with staff to evaluate where we think we can make some efficiency improvements. Um, and then so we're working through that right now. So we kind of essentially have two parallel processes moving at the same time. So we have that internal work that we're doing. And then we also have this work group that we are going to be kicking off this afternoon. Um, and while we are not going to be digging into the efficiency conversation today with that work group, the goal is to introduce some of our ideas that we have and also ask um, for potential concepts and ideas from that work group as well um, to essentially kind of incorporate and bring all of our ideas together and get a topic list essentially pulled together, vet those ideas, and then eventually what will then happen is we will have bill language at some point. Right now, we do not have any bill language put together for that one, hence why it's a placeholder. Great, that's really good um, context to have, Bren. Thanks for that. Um, and I, I guess I'll just flag that um, it seems that those are apples and oranges. So um, while I appreciate that the fee work group um, is a collection of really, uh, you know, smart folks with lots of experience in this space, I would hope that the department would also be extending, you know, further and really soliciting input um, from from a broad group on this one. Um, and, you know, it might mean additional uh, kind of broader meetings that are beyond um, just those who have been, you know, uh, have stood up to be in a fee work group. Thanks for that comment, Caitlin. April. Thanks, Bryn. And my assumption is you're going to talk about some of these placeholders and then a little bit further and then ask for feedback, correct? So not this meeting. Um, we are going to be discussing these topics in the fee work group, which I believe you're actually on. So um, because no, no, these I, are- I'm, I'm in all of these, the, the, the handout that we're looking at right now are, are you going to provide some additional information about each of these concepts so the the three items that i just highlighted the well construction program shortfalls the dam safety water right transaction shortfalls and then the water right efficiency bills we are going that is all that i have prepared for this group today we are going to dig into those concepts in the fee work group so those three that is pretty much all I've got planned. And then the Klamath and the Harney CREP items, we have some actual proposed language that we are going to be digging into and focusing our conversations on. And will that occur today? Yes. Okay, great. Because that was what I thought. I was like, I don't think we're quite in there yet. And I do have some questions about the Klamath one, but I think we can um, deal with that when we get there. But since... Yeah. Uh, Kaylin brought up the water right efficiency, um, and maybe that's something we can deal with with the fee group because I'm not a fan of doing more meetings if we don't have to. But uh, uh, there was a question that came up in my mind that relates to some of the transactions that, um, let's say, have, have not always been as timely as both the department and stakeholders would like. Um, can it, since we have such an array of a team of folks on today, um, is there any updates on Division 77, which for those of you that aren't familiar with that, that relates to in-stream leases. And there's been some recent discussion with my members um, about a desire to have a more streamlined process. And I know that in the past, there was some hope that the Division 77 rulemaking would facilitate that. And then in my, uh, my vernacular, it went into a black hole with some DOJ review, and I don't know where that ended up, but, um, just curious if you or someone, Dwight, or someone else might be able to give an update on that. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, <clears throat> excuse me, Kimberly, I see your hand up, but I'm going to punt that question to Raquel, who just put her hand up. Yeah, um, April, I'll have to refresh my memory on it. There was, we had started a process, and I don't know, Dwight, you can probably chime in on this as well. We had started a process on Division 77 rule updates, and then um, there was, I don't remember what the specific issue was, but there was an issue that the commission directed us to 
um, go back and work with stakeholders on. And right after that, if I'm recalling correctly, we lost our rules coordinator. Um, and so it, that rulemaking went on hold from a capacity standpoint. Um, once we had rulemaking staff hired up again, we began um, one of the other rulemakings that had been just kicked off, which was uh, Division 10 critical groundwater area rules. And we've been working on other rulemakings. So that one has been on hold um, and has not had movement as of late because of that. I do think that if there is a, this is a great example of a um, suggestion that we would like to hear um, as we talk about uh, how we make improvements, because we're really looking at improvements both um, from a, a statutory change standpoint, but also from a rule and just a procedural standpoint. Um, so on Kaylin's comment, Kaylin, I would invite you, I think, into the fee work group because, um, or, or other folks that are interested in this and certainly will bring topics back to the broader group. Um, but we see these as inter integrally tied together um, because as uh, some of you may know, when we propose fee increases, right, or when we have a fee shortfall, we often hear, so we're gonna pay you know, more money for services that are not meeting our timeliness standards, for example, right? So we know timeliness, if you look at our key performance measures is one of the key challenge areas. And so being able to reduce those backlogs is, is important um, as we go through this process. Now, I will say in terms of um, the work we've been doing, I don't know that there is any silver bullet in terms of what um, will actually result in measurable efficiencies. That I think is one of the challenges. Um, so I do look forward to hearing what ideas folks have um, on that as we go through this process. And um, certainly if you've got feedback for us, please shoot it over to Bryn. There is no need to wait. Right. So if you've got an idea, so April, I'd encourage you to shoot Bryn an email today or bring it up in the conversation later today um, to make sure we understand what um, the specific uh, efficiency issues are on that. And th that way we can take that into account. The other thing I'll note is I can hear some noise in the background, and I'm guessing that um, some of the folks uh, potentially on the phone aren't muted. Um, so we're getting a little bit of feedback. If you can mute yourselves um, and if you're on Teams, if you can mute yourselves, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, back to you, Bryn or, or um, Kimberly and Kaylin. I don't know if that is helpful or if there's additional follow up based on that. Yeah, Kimberly. Yeah, I guess I would say I, I actually agree with Kaylin that this is apples and oranges, and I was going to make that point <laughs> this afternoon in the fee meeting. Uh, but more to the point, uh, or you know, maybe a separate point is that um, we would encourage the department to um, look beyond efficiencies and streamlinings. I think, as you will recall, well, I mean, these discussions have been going on for years, but if you will recall, in 2023. Representative Helm, um, and I believe Owens was on it as well, had the WUBA concept. We are not advocating for the WUBA concept, but that morphed into discussions about, um, you know, convening a work group to have discussions about sort of broader uh, ways to improve the water right permitting processes, contested cases, and it was not narrow to efficiencies or streamlining. So. I just, you know, I would ask that we not narrow the discussion by labeling it as efficiencies or streamlining and allow the necessary conversations to take place. Thanks. Kaylin? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, while I appreciate the invitation to participate in a fee work group, um, I had to go back and look at my email and this is not that you know this is a i pasted into the chat the invitation from the department to participate and this is looking at as i read it a more sustainable and long-term funding model to support owrd's fee-based programs so i would really caution the department against expanding this into 
development of an LC around efficiency of how water right um, applications and transfer applications and lease applications are are handled. Um, this this feels like a a real um, you know I I I'm just I'm not feeling that the uh, the what we're hearing now at all matches what we heard when when this uh, fee work group was first proposed. So putting that out there and um, really encouraging the department to think twice before broadening something that's a fee work group into an LC workshop. Thanks. Caitlin, I appreciate um, you sharing that perspective. As you can imagine, I don't know when those were sent out, but um, things evolve over time. So we will uh, evaluate that and see how we proceed from there. Um, at the end of the day, both of these will merge right into the these regular kind of stake broader stakeholder meetings that we have or legislative concept and budget development meetings so um Bryn, you and i can talk more about that uh we are not having a bunch of uh information today in that other fee work group so for those of you that are feeling like you're missing out um really uh, our focus today is going to be more on fees. So we'll evaluate that from a next step standpoint. I do want to be cognizant of folks time though as well and the number of meetings we do have. So under a short period of time. Kimberly, is that a legacy hand or is that a new hand? That's a legacy hand. Sorry about that. No worries. OK. So that was a nice conversation. Thank you. Let's move on into the other two concepts uh, that we have today um, that are actually that we've got some actual legislative language to um, to to put in front of all of you. Um, so I will apologize ahead of time. We are going to do some uh, jumping back and forth between the PowerPoint and some some proposed legislative language. So. Um, if you if you get car sick, just uh, uh, brace yourself. Um, so we're going to start off with the Klamath leases and temporary transfers program sunset date. Um, so for a little bit of background for everyone, Senate Bill 206 back in 2015 granted the department the authority to approve temporary transfers and leases for de determined claims in the upper Klamath Basin, um, which is actively undergoing adjudication. So this authority sunsets in January of 2026. And if the authority sunsets, we will not be able to approve or process any leases or temporary transfers for determined claims until the adjudication is completed, by which time it will be something different. <laughs> um, and what this ultimately does is it limits the ability uh, for water users to actually use their water. Um, and so just for a little bit of program background for everybody, uh, the department receives about one to two temporary transfers or leases under this program each year. Um, so that totals to about a dozen since program inception in 2015. Um, and what our proposed solution is for this um, is to essentially um, extend the program and have the authority repeal upon the completion of the adjudication process. Um, Raquel, I see your hand up. Yeah, Bryn, I'm wondering if it would be good to pull up some of the handouts so that folks know kind of where to look. Um, yep. I think they've seen this slide now for a bit, so it might be helpful so they can see really where we're digging into now. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Um, is this uh, I'm just going to look for some head nods. Is this big enough for everyone to see? Or is it too? Okay, perfect. Great. Um, so this is in your 2025 potential legislative concept handout that's on the website and also in the meeting materials. Um, but this is some draft proposed language that essentially what it does is it, um, excuse me, I lost my place a little bit. Uh, this is proposed language that essentially repeals the authority upon the final determination um, by decree of the rights to the waters of the upper Klamath Basin. So 
It essentially, it doesn't extend the sunset date. It just says once the adjudication is done um, and you've got the final decreed rights, then we will repeal the sunset date because it will not be needed. So that's the, the gist of what the concept is proposing to do. Um, so that, that's relatively straightforward. But um, this is the language we've got drafted at this point in time. Um, and we wanted to put this in front of everybody and see if anyone had any thoughts, comments, um, items that you think we should be aware of on, oops, on this. Um, I will open the floor. And I know, April, you had a question. Um, April, go ahead. Uh, so my my question was, um, what is the status of the Klamath adjudication? Uh, like a broader status update? Yeah, I, well, and I, I think maybe not to dive too much into the weeds, um, mm -hmm. and this shouldn't fall on the two of you uh, entirely since you've got other folks on here, but you know, what is, particularly for those that maybe aren't as familiar with this issue um, and maybe wondering why taking off the date, my opinion, makes, makes sense to facilitate the limited number of folks who could take advantage of uh, this process while the, the legal process around the contested claims and whatnot are, are moving forward. And so I think that the question would be more, is there a general idea, thought, goal of when that process may come to a conclusion, which would give folks an idea of when we would be removing the sunset and uh, a thought of the climate basin actually having water rights, which um, just also for folks that aren't as familiar, the adjudication process started in the 70s. And um, while there's been a lot of progress, there's probably still some time left. So um, that's my question. Thank you, April. I will touch on this. I cannot give you an estimate as to when the adjudication process will be over. This is in the Klamath Circuit Court, and there are two processes that are ongoing right now. One is that there are exceptions that have been filed, and the court will be working through those exceptions over time. I do not know how long that process is going to take. But in addition to that, part of the uh, part of the adjudication that had been submitted to the Klamath Circuit Court has been remanded to the department to address some further issues through a contested case process. And so uh, we've got these two parallel tracks that are ongoing and they're really, uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot provide you with a uh, an estimate that would give any comfort as to when this process is going to be wrapped up. It's going to be going on for for quite a while, knowing that at the very end we are awaiting a decree from the court. So that is going to be a long process. And Doug, I think your answer shows why we have not proposed a specific date. Um, it is why we have proposed here that um, that this be repealed upon a final determination by decree of the rights. Um, one item I'll note is I don't know if legislative council will allow us to draft it in this manner. So that will be a question that we need to have a conversation with legislative council on. Um, but from our standpoint, as you all know, if, if when you participate in a legislative process, um, there's a workload associated with proposing legislative concepts, even if they are just extending a sunset. And uh, I think that there are a lot of other policy priorities that folks would like us to spend time on. And so that's why we would like to make it so this is not, um, so this one is, is there while we need it and um, that we don't have to keep going back because um, things that, you know, we hadn't anticipated, such as, for example, the remand, um, have come up, right? So that's one of the reasons why we're proposing this approach. But I do want to acknowledge that we may have to fall back, depending on what Legislative Council tells us, we may have to fall back on a uh, actual date. And from our standpoint, we would like to not have to keep revisiting this. So we would like to make it a longer date than a shorter date. So. 
Um, we'll be doing some checking in on that, um, but we'd love to hear folks' thoughts on this today if there are any. Kimberly? Yeah, just so everyone is on the same page, could someone at the department explain to this group the meaning of section 13C having to do with in stream pieces and rank? And I'm just flagging that because that has been a topic of discussion in the past. So, I'm sorry, Kimberly, what part were you asking us to explain? Yeah, and or I can just flag it for the group as something we can discuss in the future. But it's the section that says it doesn't allow a person to purchase, lease, or accept a gift of a determined claim for conversion to an in-stream oh. right? Okay, um, so that is a reference to a permanent transfer mm -hmm. versus a temporary yeah. transfer. So this bill is just about um, allowing temporary leasing of water and streams, so not on a permanent basis, or temporarily transferring um, determined claims. So, and that's in part because um, we can't do it on a permanent basis, right? Because the we still don't have these um, these rights decreed. And once we have the full scope of what the water rights are through the decree, then we'll be able to allow folks to do these on a permanent basis. But in the meantime, uh, there's lower risk um, to all parties involved if it's uh, done on a temporary basis. Yes, thank you for that. Just want to make sure everyone was on the same page and just, you know, we may want to look at the word lease in that sentence just because it I've had people approach us because they are confused. But we can we can deal with that later. Thank you, Kimberly. That um statute is always a bit confusing. And so I appreciate you noting that. Um and also <laughs> Also, I'm glad I remembered what it was because I had to read it for a second. I was like, I know what that is. So thank you for the quiz on the spot, too. Any other questions, thoughts, comments on this bill and or the language associated? Great. All right. So we're going to move on then to the Harney Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program other fund transfer. Um, and this is one that we are still considering whether or not we want to pursue. So it is still drafty at this point. Um, but I'll give some background on the program. Um, and make sure that everyone kind of understands what we're what we're proposing to do because it looks very technical as as it's up on the screen in front of you. So the Harney Valley Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program is a voluntary federal program operated by the Farm Service Agency in partnership with the department. And the ultimate goal of the program is to incentivize landowners to voluntarily cancel their groundwater rights within the Harney Valley. Uh, groundwater area of concern or the, the give gap. So the program essentially operates by providing funding for up to 15 years of payments to landowners who voluntarily cancel those groundwater rights. Um, in our base budget currently, we have a $500,000 general fund allocation that exists within our base budget. And so those of you who are well-versed on the budget process, general fund appropriations, if unspent at the end of a biennium, return to the state general fund to be redistributed the next go around. And so while under normal circumstances, that's a pretty common thing that occurs with a lot of our funding, um, this issue with the general fund allocation for this program specifically ultimately contributes to um, limiting the number of participants that can actually be enrolled at a given time. Um, in theory, what that essentially means is that because we have to spend all the money at once um, or it goes away, 
it essentially incentivizes landowners to just have to settle for a lump sum payment whenever they enroll in the program to ensure that they're getting the full um, they're realizing the full benefit of the program, essentially. And what that does is it limits the number of people that can actually be engaged at any point in time, and it limits the flexibility of the program for the community. So what our proposal is um, to essentially evaluate and look at how we can fix this issue um, is to create a new account that allows for general funds to be put into that account and then have them roll over into other funds. Um, if they're unspent at the end of the biennium, which essentially allows us to retain those unspent funds um, from biennium to biennium. And that operates similarly to some of our other programs. Place-based planning fund operates that way. We have some other funds, I believe, that operate in that manner. And it just provides a little more stability to the funding. Um, and ultimately what this, what this will do is it will allow us to have a little more flexibility in committing to either longer term payment plans or lump sum contracts to ultimately meet the needs of every participant that wants to ultimately enroll in the program. And so again, as I mentioned, moving towards a model of having more longer term contracts where we can space the payments out in smaller amounts allows us to enroll more participants at any given time, which increases um, the, the effectiveness of the program. And um, as we understand it, there are uh, several technical fixes that we have to actually go through, um, making this kind of a little more complicated than I think <laughs> some of us thought uh, actually addressing this issue would be. And so um, we can get into more or less what those technical fixes are. But before we do that, I did want to stop and see if anyone had any questions about the program and um, kind of what the proposed solution is uh, before we jump into kind of the technical language of of exactly what we think we need to do to fix to address this um peggy i saw your hand come up yeah but first i have to figure out where in the heck the stuff is on teams <laughs> good morning and thank you uh i'm sorry i was late i tried to get into the fee uh <laughs> link instead of the <laughs> instead of the budget link um so I'm seeing this happening more and more around a number of agencies. What kind of response do you think that you are getting from the budget people uh, around this concept? It seems it seems to make a great deal of sense. After all, it would take care of uh, a longer term accomplishing the task that we're working towards. But the more we put into these special funds, the less they are available in case we have a downturn in the economy. And although I know we have a good rainy day fund, I'm just wondering what kind of response you're getting from LFO or others around this concept. Raquel, I saw you come off camera, so I don't know if you want to had something else you wanted to talk about before I address that. Um, well, I think my comments are are a bit to what Peggy is getting at. So if okay. you would like to respond, I'm happy to then fill in or if you just want me to go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, Peggy, I appreciate the question because um, as I noted for or as Bryn noted, we <laughs> we're one and the same here sometimes. Um, is that we're not sure we're going to run this concept and part of it is that analysis um, that you're talking about and that um that our the utmost importance to us is that we continue to have five hundred thousand dollars appropriated to us every biennium so we can continue to have this program now the way it currently is working for those of you that are um not as familiar with the budget process or maybe we just haven't articulated it is that it's currently a line item in our base budget which means that in its general fund dollars so what that means is that every biennium the agency in our base budget receives five hundred thousand dollars at the end of the biennium so our bienniums run in a two-year period so ending june 30th of odd numbered years um at the end of the biennium, if we have not spent that money, it goes back to the general fund. 
right? And then a new. So if we, let's say we spend $250,000, $250,000 that's remaining goes back to the general fund. And then on July 1st, we get another $500,000. It's not cumulative. We don't then have $750,000. We still only have $500,000. For a program that is trying to guarantee payments for 15 years, that is really a challenge, obviously. We are asking folks through this program to essentially retire their water rights, and folks should be paid for that, right? Um, so the challenge for this program is, is that balance there, right, of, of how we, well, so let me take a step back then. On the one hand, we would like to propose it because obviously if it's accumulating for whatever's unused, then that'll help us guarantee payments into the future. On the other hand, um, we are concerned because as Bryn had noted where she's about to go in terms of how this gets accomplished. And this is how we think it gets accomplished. We've got to do some more conversations with folks, but our understanding of the way we have to accomplish this is that we have to disappropriate the funds from our budget and then have them reappropriated in a different manner. And remember when I said it's of utmost importance that we continue to have this funding. Um, and asking the legislature to disappropriate and then reappropriate certainly makes me nervous, right? And so I anticipate that we'll be having conversations both with the community, with all of you, and I, I think Rep Owens is on here as to um, one, whether we pursue it, because in my mind, new, a new $500,000 that doesn't accumulate every biennium, um, but is there, is better than no dollars, right? So if we're not able to get it reappropriated, um, but it would be best if it would accumulate, right? And so it would be best if we could get it reappropriated into a fund and have it reappropriated. So that's the part that we're trying to sort through and have these conversations with you all. Um, certainly, Rep Owens, you'll be hearing from us as well as with the community because we really want to make sure that this is the, you know, the actions that we take. If we propose it, we need to be able to get it through to the finish line. So, um, Oh, I, I see Peggy's hand now, so maybe we'll go back to Peggy. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate you explaining to everybody about that. So there have been, and during this last 2024 session, there was some uh, movement of disappropriation and reappropriation, moving funds around from one to the other. The thing that I worry about is if you only spend 275 of the 500, then even though technically it's in your base budget, that doesn't mean it gets to stay in your base budget because the legislature could choose, well, if you're only spending 275, why should we put 500 into this base budget? We can always cut from the base budget too. The base budget is just another thing to be worked on by the legislature. So I just wanna make that point as well, that it, you're concerned about losing it all because you're disappropriating and reappropriating you could also be losing it the other way around. I just wanna raise that point. What really needs to happen is some sort of an agreement amongst, um, between LFO, between the legislative leadership and between the governor's office as to the best way to make this happen and to protect the concept that we know we're trying to work on. So thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, Peggy, I appreciate that. And that risk is always there, right? With any state agency budget, Every two years, the legislature makes a decision and um, there there may be, you may get funds added one year and then the next year those funds are removed. And um, we are doing, we want to do our best to make sure that we continue to, to make sure that that does not happen for this program specifically, because um, we know how important this program is um, and will be, right? It's, um, it, it may not be used yet, Right. But we believe that it will be important. And therefore, we do want to make sure that we are. I'm seeing a thumbs up on some from someone. Thank you, whoever that was. Um, 
And so that's where it's, uh, there are, you know, we have limited power, but there are things that agencies can do. And, and some of it is saying, protect this funding and which means, you know, take this funding, right? And we always have to make those hard choices, right? And trade-offs and um, in any budget situation. Um, and so we're just trying to set this program up to be as successful as possible. So it's a, it's a hard choice for us on that front. That's Thanks why it's go. important to have the conversation with every, with the people in charge because you're right the pro i think the program is important and it was my thumb this is peggy uh, but i okay <laughs> uh, thank you peggy you know it, it is important but we need to make sure it's we don't lose it in another way so anyway thanks got it thank you peggy that's great advice yeah, so let's move into kind of what the proposed language looks like and to kind of dovetail off of what Peggy said, we have been um, starting to engage in conversations with uh, both CFO and LFO on this to one, make sure that we are uh, doing things technically correct, that we're not missing anything um, to make sure that we're actually achieving what we are hoping to achieve with this. Um, and we'll also be having those other conversations, um, as Peggy alluded to. That's a really great advice. Um, so I want to direct everybody to this is page three of the potential LC concept topics list. If you have, if you're following on paper or on another screen, um, but essentially this proposed language has four different components, basically four different sections that we believe we actually have to do in order to get us to and other funds account, essentially. Um, and so this is, again, draft language. So first, uh, as Raquel, Raquel alluded to, we have to remove the original general fund appropriation from our base budget. Second, we have to then establish an account that will accept general fund appropriations and then roll those appropriations over into an other funds account at the end of the biennium. We then have to reappropriate that general fund, um, the original funding essentially into that newly established account. And then because they will be converted to other funds, we have to increase our expenditure limitation um, within that account so that we have the cap to actually spend the money. And so if you look at sections one, two, three, and four, they essentially run through, they achieve each of those four items that I just mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> again, so we are working with some of the the accounting big brains, I like to call them, to make sure that we are uh, that the language that we are considering actually does what we want it to do. So um, that's what you see in front of you today, with all the caveats that Raquel already covered. Um, so I want to see if there are any additional thoughts, questions, items for discussion on this on this item. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, I'm not seeing any hands either. So I'm going to take that as a cue to move on. Oh, is that Tammy? This is Tammy Denny with the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. Would it make sense, this is maybe a little picky, but would it make sense to add to language that further describes conservation reserve, reserve enhancement program and give it its proper do as being a USDA natural resources conservation program? Unless there are two CREP programs, but I'm only aware of one. Is it helpful for the reader to understand that this, this is a matching fund with USDA? That's a great question. Not? I don't know, um, but that is definitely a question that we should float with um, with LFO and CFO as we, uh, as we, um, explore more about this. Representative Owens, great to see ya. You're muted. Just, uh, I'm sure you're saying something. First time I've <laughs> ever been on Teams. Uh, one, thanks for the conversation. I do believe the department's headed in the correct direction here. Tammy, I believe that is an important conversation when we reach out to stakeholders in this group and additional stakeholders, that this is only 25% of the total funding that will be allocated to this program. The federal government has committed to 75% of the funding, and we're working on different authorizations in the next farm bill. But this is a 
down payment for those contracts to get people signed up. I do think somehow if we could word that so the community broader doesn't understand that the state is uh, responsible for the total amount of the CREP program. Thank you, Representative. Bryn, um, I I know we're looking at the language here, and so we should, I don't know, I, I don't have the handout pulled up, but we should make sure that's in any of our handouts, because um, mm -hmm. that is a, a really critical point yep. that, that the state is and the, the folks we serve, Oregonians, are getting the better end of the deal here on this, um, so it'd be great to make sure we make that point. Okay. Oh. Peggy, good suggestion on the whereas. We'll um we'll explore kind of what what the mechanics look like for for this. Okay. Hey. All right. Any anything else on this item? All right, so with that, we're gonna move on to ways to provide feedback and next steps. So um, this will not be the only venue that you will have to provide feedback. Um, there will be several options outside of, I think the, the formal stakeholder meetings will, um, after this slide, we'll talk about when the next meetings are scheduled just so everyone is on the same page, um, but, Outside of these meetings, there are other opportunities to provide feedback. First, um, there is an attached worksheet that is both on our website, it's attached to the meeting materials, um, and you were also emailed it yesterday. That is just essentially a comment form. It's got all of the different legislative concept topics and then a space for you to provide any comments. The proposed language is also that, that you've all seen today um, is also included within that worksheet as well. So if you'd rather submit written feedback, um, on those, that is a great option. Um, I do ask that those be returned to me by April 2nd, um, just to give us adequate time to process that, review it, ensure that we understand and do any follow-up if we need to. Um, so April 2nd is the date that we would really appreciate having that feedback by. Um, if the worksheet doesn't work for you or it's not um, downloading or there's issues or whatever, you can also send me an email with any feedback that you'd like to share as well. Um, I'll be keeping track in both spaces. Um, and then another thing you may be able to do is request a meeting with us if you were unable to, to join today. This is for folks who may be watching this recording. <laughs> um, if you were unable to join us today or you have things that um, you'd like to share with us, you can also request a meeting. Um, additionally, there are future stakeholder meetings for this broader group as well as the fee-based program work group that we mentioned earlier in the meeting. So there are other stakeholder opportunities and engagement opportunities there. Um, I am your contact for all of this. So if you have questions, if you wanna submit feedback, if you wanna reach out and get a meeting set up, um, my email is in this PowerPoint. Um, it's also all over the website um, and all over the meeting materials. So that's where you can find me. Um, in terms of our tentative meeting date, We've got two more public meetings slated for April 9th and then May 7th. So those meeting invites have been sent out. So those of you who are on this call, if you received the meeting invite from myself, you should also have these on your calendar. If you do not, please reach out to me um, and we will work quickly to get you added to that meeting, uh, those meetings as soon as possible um, and, and work out whatever technical bugs there might be. So um, with that, are there any <clears throat> Excuse me. Are there any questions about providing feedback or the logistics of any upcoming meetings? All right, I'm not seeing anything. So um, it looks like we're going to get out of here a little bit early, um, which is always great. Love running those efficient meetings. 
Um, so with that, I don't have anything else for the group. Um, I just want to say, as as always, thank you everyone so much for your time and your attention to this issue um, and your engagement. And um, we will be, oh, Peggy, I see your question. Where will we find the recording? Um, we are hopefully going to be able to get this posted to our website over the next week or so. So the recording should be posted on the website once it's recovered and kind of compressed and then uploaded. So it will be on the website with all of the other meeting materials. Um, so with that, I just, again, want to say thank you. Um, if, again, there are any other questions, comments that you may have after this, you all know where to find me. Um, I am always available. So with that, we look forward to future discussions on this and hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.